All right, we're recording. Now I just want to ask each of you, and you guys can, whoever wants to talk, how and why you got involved in Oh My, and what your expectations are. The obvious reason uh, is that we felt, all of us artist managers, by the current situation that we are still going through the pandemic, contracts being cancelled. A lot of us colleagues have been openly speaking to one another as, as to how best deal with things, how to come through this, well, quite frankly, tragedy. We needed a body of people in order to look at all of these things. And I think we can all agree that there was something always needed for purely artist managers together, as opposed to being, I suppose, secretive, because we all compete against one another. And, and born out of that was um, Opera Managers Association International. One of the great things about OMI oh is that we are the first organization of its kind that is exclusively for opera managers. We're not an addendum to a different art form association. We are our own. And so we can focus our conversations and our actions on very specific things in a way that we might not be able to if we were part of another larger organization. For me personally, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to get involved with the piece because I knew that we were going to have an incredible creation process. We could make it something special and unique. There are a lot of brilliant people involved in, in the association with actually one driving goal, and that's the art form, and the betterment of the art form. We've broken down a barrier now during this time that is going to drive the industry forward, but specifically drive artist management forward in a different way and a better, more productive, a more collegial way. Yes, I think the I think the opera industry at large is paying attention to what we're doing now. We have really have the opportunity to do some good advocacy for our profession and our artists and make a difference. I was a bit shaken by that secrecy and lack of generosity to new colleagues. And I made the decision, well, when I get to the point when people start asking me for help, I'm gonna be open. And I thought something's gonna change this. It's gonna have to be big, it's gonna be a sledgehammer and it's gonna hurt. Mm -hmm. And it was COVID. God bless Zoom, because without it, I don't think we'd be here. Mm. This this extraordinary platform suddenly meant that because we weren't leaving our homes, we had no choice to be open. So even people who would never have given away a skerrick of information before suddenly needed information. This is the chance to do it. I mean, I leapt at the opportunity to be involved mm. in any way I could. That is one of the characteristics of us from the beginning was our openness and transparency. <laughs> and we've written in, that into the mission statement. Yeah. Aside from the obvious strength in numbers, strength in unity. Yes. Strength in being colleagues. Mm -hmm. You, you right. can achieve something, which you can't do when you're being secretive and standing by yourself. When the shit really hits the fan, you know, that you know you can pick up the phone to your colleagues or somebody will have your back. That's, that's priceless for me. A couple things come to mind about why I got involved. I always had this feeling that we were, the, the phrase skating on thin ice, uh, comes to mind in terms of, of how we did business. I, I never felt like artist managers were integrated into the business in the same way. Having come from a large artist management company, going to Opera America, the fact that artist managers weren't really included in the conference. If you went to the League of American Orchestras conference, people did business there. You were booking there. You were taking meetings. But Opera America, it was like, not there. And I always felt like it was, we were very siloed. To me, that didn't make sense because we're the business people. As the pandemic happened, as the world began to shut down, as we all, as we all panicked, when there was an opportunity to be a part of something where we would be able to, en masse, become more involved, become consequential, I wanted to be a part of that. Not only did I get involved with the, the founding of Omai, I now sit on the opera committee of IAMA. I now I have a very close relationship with a lot of people in the United States I never thought I would, including AGMA, which is a relationship that I'd be willing to bet two years ago, if you asked artist managers throughout North America, that we would be able to work with AGMA side by side, everyone would have laughed about it, but it's happening now. In the past year, we have taken a step forward in being more consequential within the business than artist managers ever have. Mm -hmm. which I think is only going to make our industry stronger. Right. Um, I th so I, I think, I think that, that's what really excites me. 
That's, I think that's a very good point. We are uh, raising our profile and putting ourselves on the map in a way that we haven't been before. We've been more in the background, working, working solo, competing with each other. Now we can work as an entity to put ourselves on the map. And again, I think advocate more for the arts at a time when we're really going to be needing it because things are changing right out from underneath us. And that's kind of scary. Banding together in numbers to look at what's happening now as we begin to come back and see the changes in the contracts and the media contracts, for example, I think we can have a really positive influence on. I, I think something you just said, Sarah, kind of triggered something for me, which is the word advocate. I think we are now advocating as a collective body for the entire collective body of artists, which has a lot of power to it. At a political level, these politicians, left and right, have to get the message of just how much money culture brings into the economy. Well, the lobbyists on our side are not as tough. The performing arts, specifically, I'm gonna use the term Western classical music, mm -hmm. needs to quit being so goddamn snobby about yes. who we are and what our role is in the world. We are entertainment. And if we believe that we are some more important, holier than thou art form, and that we're any different than Beyonce, Billie Eilish, Garth Brooks, or the Marvel empire, mm -hmm. we are going to fail. When a Marvel film sells $1.5 billion in tickets, people pay attention to that. We've got to become friends with those industries. We are competing for those dollars. We are competing for those people's attention. And we've avoided that and kept ourselves off in our ivory tower. And we get ignored. I think some of that is changing just by the nature of what's happening around us. For example, in the Me Too movement, also since George Floyd and the whole discussion about, about racism. Those culture conversations, Jeffrey, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that they, and, and it's the younger generation too, the millennials who are now being trained um, in the opera conservatories in a different way than, than they were 20, 25 years ago. In North America, opera is treated as this precious little China doll that if, if anybody breathes wrong, it's just gonna shatter and fall apart. I think some of that is the nature of, only, of regional opera companies only doing four productions a year. So it is precious for them. But at the same time, we can't spend three or four years workshopping a piece to death yeah. so that it doesn't have any life to it. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, you may get a George Floyd opera or a Breonna Taylor opera, but we're not going to see it till 2025. <laughs> Silenzio, silenzio, silenzio.